very much. OK, corner started, Chair. Yeah. Good evening, everybody, and Hello. welcome evening. to the Corporate Performance and Resources Scrutiny Committee. Um, before we get going, there's the etiquette, which I have to read out to you all, so I apologise for this. But can we remind everybody that this meeting is being live streamed and it has been recorded? Can all participants mute themselves when not speaking in order to avoid any background noise or feedback? If you want to speak, if you could raise your hand virtually or if your camera's on physically um, and we'll take your questions, please do not use the chat function to debate any issues for the sake of this recording. And can all other attendees Officers and non-committee members who are attending turn their cameras off and mute themselves until called to speak by myself. Um, one last request for me, it's not on the actual instructions, but um, we've got a busy and comprehensive agenda ahead for this evening. So can I respectfully ask all members to keep questions and contributions to the end of each session so we don't interrupt the officers while they're speaking. And it's possible that your questions might be answered further on into the presentation in any case that would be wonderful so if we can speedily progress through to the next stage which is apologies for absence have we had any i, I haven't heard any but uh i've not had any directly chair okay that's fantastic um second then do we have any declarations of interest tonight nope that's brilliant too so as I said, it's quite a comprehensive agenda we've got this evening. Um, the work that we're covering is first off the annual corporate safeguarding report. Um, this has come down from Cabinet for our scrutiny. Um, we've got the report in its entirety, as you all know, um, but it is going to all of the scrutiny committees as well. So I think the only element of the report which is in line with our portfolio is at Appendix C. Um, then the second issues tonight. We've got the Cabinet's draft response to Welsh Government's consultation, statutory guidance and directions. Um, then we've got the Project Zero update, then revenue monitoring um, for the first quarter, capital monitoring for the first quarter, and then the annual delivery plan monitoring report, um, which is the whole performance for last year. So as I said, we have a bumper um, meeting. So with no further ado, if we can go straight over to Laith for the annual corporate safeguarding report. Thanks very much. OK, yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Yeah, and thank you for explaining the, the, the process. This is a large uh, report, as, as you mentioned, um, but as you say, we're only dealing with, with Section C of the report that comes to this um, scrutiny committee. Um, I'm happy to share, share my screen if that, uh, if that helps. And I can then just talk through some of the, some of the data uh, aspects of, of, of what we're doing. So hopefully you can see that. OK, so you said this is obviously safeguarding from a, um, I suppose, recruitment perspective, which is which is what we're dealing with as part of this is obviously a crucial part of what we do within within the council. Um, obviously, a huge amount of jobs that that, that we recruit to uh, that obviously staff work with children um, and obviously vulnerable adults and therefore have to go through numerous checks I suppose as part of that to make sure that the staff we're appointing uh, have the relevant uh, sort of checks and, and balances in place before they uh, before they start that process. Sometimes as we say that's not always the case that we can get those checks in, in place um, due to some sort of you know sometimes urgency of positions we're trying to recruit to sometimes delays in in trying to get certain checks through whether it's references or or um, DBS checks and, and so on um, and if that's the case we do go through processes where we can um, apply a risk assessment to to get a no staff in in post um, so in, to I suppose to ensure that obviously that you know they have unsupervised access at that time while we're waiting for those checks checks to happen um, so this is just an overview really of, of that compliance rate um, for the last uh, year from April 2021 to 22. Um, I think we've obviously discussed this previously in, in one of our pre-meetings, but just to highlight the fact that um, almost every year when we bring these reports, 
the compliance rates are, are fairly high. We've never quite hit 100%, um, but they've always hovered around the 98, 99% um, sort of level. Um, but for last year, we actually hit 93%, which is probably one of our, our lowest lowest figures for, for for a long time ever since, obviously, me working for the council for the last five years. Um, so that equated to 37 breaches altogether. Um, if I go to table one, uh, this is the overview of the whole uh, of the council's appointments uh, that require these um, safeguards and checks in place. Um, so already you can see that within one year we've made 538 uh, sort of appointments, which again, it, first of all, that is a huge increase on, on previous year's uh, appointment levels. Again, this is a year, as you can appreciate, that was during COVID. Um, and actually the, the biggest increase surrounding these figures are actually within our schools uh, sort of functions, uh, as you can appreciate with everything that's happening with, with COVID, with absences, with um, sort of changes to working patterns and, and all those things that there was a huge increase in the recruitment to try and replace those staff that were that were off to make sure all the schools and, and the things were, were running effectively. Um, so even if you take take the September figure, if I just highlight that that quickly, which again from obviously from a school's perspective, um, September is the um, is the start of the term and that's where we make most of our, our school appointments. Uh, so actually we made you know 225 appointments when normally in the September for, for the Vale we make around anything from 60 to 90 appointments. So already there was over 100% increase in, in the appointments for that period. Uh, and that was where the majority of the of the breaches took um, took place. Um, so to just bear that in mind as we go through just the, the few of the pages that, that we're working through. Um, so that's that's the figures you say with the corporates and the schools uh, in, in one. Um, the table two is just the schools uh, sort of taken out of that figure. Um, so again, it just shows where we are in terms of the compliance rates um, during during the year. It's good to see a few hundred percent through there, but again, you know, we were we were a bit lower in that in that September figure, which we've explained previously. Um, just for as well as clarity, I've, I've looked actually at our first quarter figure for this year. So the same quarter last year, we we had eight um, eight breaches altogether. Um, so far in the first quarter for schools this year, we've had three. Um, so again, hopefully a, a much better improvement for this year um, as well going forward. But again, it, it's something we, we keep an eye out um, sort of constantly. And if I just scroll down very quickly again to the compliance rate for the corporate uh, sort of departments, again, actually overall, we, we just had two, um, uh, two breaches, which actually put our figures to 99%. So again, that's going back to the fact that generally Obviously, generally the breaches do happen within our uh, within our schools, um, and and also actually some of this does relate to the to the date of the start of the term uh, as well. We've been looking at the reasons why those breaches happened, um, and it's something that actually we're reviewing the policy on how we how we monitor the safeguarding uh, sort of data. Um, when you look back at the schools starting date for September in 2021. Um, the start date actually for, for schools that went back was a Friday. Now, a lot of the schools actually used that as an inset day. So actually pupils didn't technically attend attend the school until the following Monday or Tuesday because the schools used those couple of days in order to get the schools ready because they were still operating under, under COVID rules. Now, when you when you take that into account, um, the, the data reporting for breaches meant that even though teachers or some teachers started on the Friday, even though there were no pupils in the school, that would still be classed as a breach. Um, and sometimes actually we would get those those risk assessments in place, you know, on that day one, which meant technically actually there wasn't a breach, but we had to report it just because of the nature of the of the reporting mechanism. Um, so we're actually reviewing that at the moment and seeing actually if if in future a teacher starts in school when there's no children present because it's an inset day that wouldn't be classed as a breach. Um, I think that will 
it's not trying to help our figures, but I think it's just trying to be realistic in terms of how how we're we're monitoring and and you know making sure we're doing doing things properly. As we said, we you know when we do get a breach, we do tr treat it very seriously and make sure that not only the individual knows that they're they're missing the reference or DBS or or something, but and so does the, the head teacher or the manager, uh, they're fully aware. Um, and what we have, we've got a process in place to make sure that those checks come in, you know, as soon as practically possible. And and to make sure that we have, you know, again, those risk assessments in place to make sure that they're, they're you know, they're not working with the vulnerable or the children uh, while we're waiting for those those checks to happen. Um, and we're very clear, you know, from a council perspective that that's, that's you know, how, how it works. Um, so, as I said, you know, it, uh, this is, um, you know, as soon as the data as it is, it's unfortunate, obviously, that we hit a, a slightly lower, lower figure. But I think based on the, the volumes of recruitment coming through, we were still under COVID rules, which means actually it was difficult to get hold of some individual's references because either they were off with with COVID or, uh, uh, you know, other issues were, were happening. Um, so it was probably a bit of a, a different year than the, the normal. Um, but again, I'm that's as I say, it's only that part of the report that we are, are looking at. Um, so I'm happy to take take any questions, I suppose, from the um, from the members. That's great. Thank you ever so much for um, for that. And uh, it is reassuring to hear that non-compliance is monitored. And if you have repeat offenders, um, schools, that you would be contacting them for further discussions. Um, anybody else with any questions now for Leith? No? No, Chair. There we are. OK. You can go. Oh, well, thank, thanks very and much. En and enjoy, enjoy your son's birthday. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank thanks you. ever so much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, right then, everybody. So can we just um, move on that? Will we have yeah. a nomination? Oh, sorry. No, no, that's fine, Chair. I was just going to mention about that, but you've, you've, oh. jumped, you've, jumped, you've, you've, you've preempted me, so apologies <laughs> for that. Yes. So can we just uh, have a nomination then to move on this? I move, Chair. That's wonderful. Um, I'll, seconder? I'll second it, Chair. Excellent. So we can then move on to the second um, presentation tonight. Now, this is the Cabinet's draft response to the Welsh Government consultation. Um, and I think we have Jeff Rees to present this. Yes, we do. Thank yes, you. you do, Chairman. Good evening. You, good, Jeff. Good, good evening, good evening all. Um, apologies mm. from Debbie. Debbie would have been normally here for the meeting, but she's away on annual leave at the moment. So she's kindly asked me to step in, which I'm more than happy to do. Um, so just just picking up the point that you made earlier in your opening address, Chairman, this is a reference that's come via the Cabinet from the 23rd of June. Um, when Cabinet considered, they obviously considered the attached appendix, which is the proposed draft response to Welsh Government. By and large, it's, it's quite a technical document. Um, some of it obviously relates to things like constitution and constitution guides and such like. Um, but obviously, it, it's, it's a wide and varied, um, diverse piece of uh, guidance that they're consulting on. And that's predominantly based on the, the fact that the act, the act itself is a significant cornerstone piece of legislation. Um, and that obviously contains a number of provisions that promote diversity, involvement and participation within the local government family in Wales. So it, it's it's something that all authorities across Wales are, are coming, coming to terms with in terms of making sure all the necessary aspects are put into place. And certainly um, returning members um, of the council who are in the meeting tonight will be aware that over the last 18 months or so, there have been some reports linked to the Local Government Election Wales Act for example, around uh, family absence arrangements, for example, and um, interim guidance on multi-location meetings. So that's two pieces. There's also been some additional consultation that Welsh Government's been running in tandem to, to the, the current consultation. So most recently, that would have been on corporate joint committees. There would have been a set of uh, consultations that would have gone through via Cabinet, where the authority would have been responding accordingly. Um, so it is quite a significant piece of, of legislation that we've got through the new act. Probably, you know, if you think back to the local government measure 2011 and then predating that the local government act 2000, which brought into, into effect cabinet and, and the executive scrutiny functions of the authority. This is probably the most 
significant piece of legislative changes affecting local government since that period of time. So, as I indicated, some of the work has already been in train in terms of um, the Act. Some of it would have come into effect last year, for example. So some of the provisions would have come into effect in May 2021. But the lion's share of the legislation would be coming into effect from fit the 5th of May this year. So if you think about it, you're thinking, oh, right, hold on a minute. We've got we've got the legislation, but we don't have the guidance in place. Um, we, we, myself, as part of the, the wider head of democratic service officers across Wales, and indeed Debbie as part of the monitor officer group, would have been speaking to colleagues in Welsh Government about the timing and obviously the delay in this process, because clearly what we've got is is the, the legislation in place, but not obviously the statutory guidance. So whilst in some areas we have interim guidance, we don't largely have all the, the necessary levers to pull in terms of the, the wider legislative aspects of the of the Act that's come into force from the 5th of May. So the presumption around around this consultation is, is obviously respond by next week, um, which is the closing date, which is the 22nd of July. Um, but clearly, in the background, we are speaking to Welsh Government colleagues about the need to get this through as quickly as possible. And the timeline that we're currently working to is the autumn of this year, 2022, before we see the final versions of this. Um, there are obviously a number of consequential amendments that have come along in this process I alluded to last year. So there would have been amendments to the Council's constitution to pick up some of the attributes that we, we would have needed to get through for the 5th of May. And that would have meant that our constitution would have been updated and we would have had to bring about um, the delivery of a constitution guide, which is one of the other provisions that we would have needed to have in place for the 5th of May. And of course, we would have had to get that through. So the in the last administration and the most recent reports would have been um, to uh, council on the 7th of March would have brought into effect things like a revised um, constitution and the um, obviously a draft consideration of a draft constitution guide um, which was um, I'm pleased to say which was approved by council um, and members would of course join in join in following the elections would have had the most up-to-date iteration of that uh, constitution and the guide as a consequence of those legislative changes so what you'll find in the constitution is things like reference to job sharing um, assistance to the executives, um, things like petitions and the change to petitions. Um, clearly, there's a, there's, a, there's a detailed element that, that you know fall, falls within Tom, my director's area around, you know, the engagement and participation stuff. So we we've we've procured some additional package of software to enable us to do greater work with our communities. Also, the provision of e-petitions and requirement to bring that in that had to be in place by the 5th of May. So we we, we have been working along steadily um, with an officer working group with an approved action plan. Just so you 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 get some context of where we are. We're not just sort of you know leaping from here to there. There is structure to the process, which has been led by Debbie, our monitoring officer, Tom Bowery and Tom is part of that process. More recently, Matt Baum has come on, who had been previously Caris Lord, and we've got people like Tracy Dickinson on there to, in terms of advising on the HR stuff. So there's there's a key, key bunch of officers working in the background on this, and clearly we will continue to work on this process right the way through once we get the guidance, because there will be further updates to the authorities' constitution required as consequent to the delivery of the additional statutory guidance. Um, what else is there to say? Um, not, not really. Um, you know, it, it is as I said, it is a, it is a, a wide sweeping piece piece of guidance. This most recent suite, if you want to call it that, um, and appreciate. Um, that obviously members would have had an opportunity to to take take account of that read through the papers. Um, much of it, I have to say, um, is is relatively straightforward. So some of the some of the existing legislation has been has been revoked, which is alluded to in the report. But I have to say the the updates have been fairly non-contentious. We have been speaking in the background. Um, as certainly from an officer's perspective, I would say, certainly not not for one second speaking on behalf of elected members, but certainly in in discussions with um, with colleagues in Welsh government, we have been making representations about how we smooth out some of the wrinkles with this and the delivery of it, and there have been. When notwithstanding, one of them is the biggest point is about you know funding of some of this stuff. Um, so, you know. Um, Oh dear. 
Am I still? Is he? Is yeah, he the I only one that's frozen? frozen? Yeah. <laughs> I believe so. I'll, Jeff, if if you can hear, can you um, just try and perhaps turn your camera off or try to restart Teams? Um, you've frozen on our end. I've managed oh. to get on my laptop now. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> great I wonder if it's anything to do with the heat, like uh, the roads melting and the, the train <laughs> lines. Um, what do they say? Buckling. It seems IT always uh, it seems to get stressed when the when the heat rises, doesn't it? I'll um, try and get in touch with uh, Jeff now, uh, Chair, see if he can rejoin. Bear with me a second. Oh dear. <laughs> I believe Jeff's back online now. Hi Jeff, you're muted. Might be a bit of a delay, but you're currently muted, Jeff. Sorry, did you hear any of that? No. Last no. Bit. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's it's, it's my my microphone's literally dropping in and out. Sorry about that. So, sorry, I will go over that last bit again. So Thank I was you. talking Thanks about I was so I was talking about the um speaking to Welsh Government colleagues about some of the issues that we encountered around the challenges, one of which was significant issues around funding and resources. Yes. And that certainly will remain an issue. Um and uh, we, we are we are going to be dealing with that. And as I said, we were working with colleagues um across across the the action plan with with uh, key officers to deliver anything that comes subsequently once once we know where we are following this this most recent round of consultation but happy to take any questions apologies for the it we can't have the sunshine and it that seems to be the case um councillor johnson uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jeff. Um, making some some comments here, largely in my sort of um, new role as as chair of the Democratic Services Committee. Um, obviously, this is a, a quite wide ranging um, consultation for for you know for principal council. So you know, into the I think it's 130 odd pages in in in, uh, in, in length, uh, and uh, a lot of the the questions that have been asked here because um, of the technical nature of it are generally are, are, are we happy um you know can we think of anything that can be added to this and so uh you know in, in this case you know sort of I'm happy to uh you know defer to you know sort of technical expertise in terms of you know sort of you know the, we can't think of anything else that, that should be added here um I just did want to sort of quickly um just just press as as I think you, you sort of mentioned there Jeff on the uh, the points relating to the Democratic Services Committee. I mean, the, the, the uh, and, and your role as head of Democratic Services. Yeah. Obviously, the uh, the Democratic Services Committee was created as part of the uh, was it the 2009 measure came into place in uh, in 2011. So we're now in the third term of it. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's some very important issues being raised in the consultation about the um, sufficiency of resources for the Democratic Services team. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to sort of you know developing uh, or understanding what the baseline is and and what we think the um, the requirement. Is. I think that's that's very important, and also important is the um, the discussion around um, providing additional research and support services um, yeah. for for members. Uh, I think that's important because there's a um, you know sort of and I I've been here you know sort of the, this is my third term now, so yeah. I've sat through two terms, and there is a uh, an imbalance between um, those officers, um, uh, cabinet members who work with officers on a regular basis, and the ability and the time that's available for uh, backbench members. Um, particularly in the opposition and, and certainly independent members, um, you know, in, to be able to access uh, information uh, in an, an accessible manner, uh, which allows them to, um, to to hold the executive to account uh, and allows those issues to be brought forward. There's a discussion there about new calls for action. Um, we've discussed in in our uh, in induction meetings about the um, you know about bringing reports, and sometimes those have taken you know quite a while to get from um, you know from being uh, requested to actually reaching a committee. So. Uh, I think there's a lot of important work that's within here. Uh, also, you know, sort of discussions around length of meetings, timing of meetings, and how we're going to uh, to consider that. So I think there's it's important to sort of flag up to to you know to to this committee uh, and also to the Democratic Services Committee about some of those changes coming down the line, um, which hopefully will uh, will improve the um, you know the backbench councillor experience in particular. 
So I have no particular um, disagreement with with any of the um, the points being being made in the consultation. As I say, a lot of them are you know, a, agreements with uh, with what's being suggested in, in in the consultation. I think maybe the only point that I, I would query is um, that we have made a few points regarding um, you know, ensuring that the Welsh language is not treated um, any any differently or any less favourably than English. Uh, and I think there is a query, there's a wider query in this consultation just about um, how we ensure that happens within a uh, majority English speaking area. Um, right. you know, uh, and I'm sure, although it's not really part of this conversation, that as we move to uh, hybrid meetings and we have uh, an interpreter available, some of those things will be uh, will be resolved. But uh, I think it's worth you know just flagging those up at the moment, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Chair. That's it. That's great. Thank you ever so much for for that contribution, Councillor Johnson. Uh, Councillor Lovelock Edwards. Thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to follow on from some of the points that uh, Councillor Johnson has made um, and, and welcome the response that's already been cited in terms of the timing of council meetings and training and development. They seem to be sort of, you know, seeking clarity, which is something that I would expect in terms of um, ensuring uh, a work life balance uh, and encouraging the diversity element. And obviously it's not just the timing of meetings, it's how we meet and it are, are sort of on premise because from as a newly elected councillor, this ability to meet um, online has really helped me in, as well as the training and development. And it's good to see that in the consultation responses, you're seeking clarity or, around that. And it's also welcome to see the response in terms of, uh, of I suppose, ethics and standards. Um, um, that's, I, I suppose, again, as a newly elected uh, uh, councillor to to understand my obligations, so that that's you know really useful too. In terms of of training and development, uh, uh, and obviously it's just a, an observation rather than a sort of an a uh, sort of a question. It it's. I see that from the consultation document that you're going to be sort of coming back to the new cohort of, uh, of councillors like myself in terms of our sort of uh, feedback. Um, do you have a timeline for that? Because I note that, you know, the response goes in next week, uh, 22nd of July, and then you're working sort of with Welsh Government and um, you've been given a timeline of around autumn for a final document. But in between, are you likely to have some initial responses to the consultation? consultation paper before the final draft is circulated in the autumn. Thank you. Um, just picking up the, the latter points raised by uh, Councillor Lovelock Edwards, in terms of the consultation, once it goes in, it'll be in a, one, one of 22 authority responses. And in fact, I'll be meeting tomorrow morning with colleagues from the WLGA and the cohort of Heads of Democratic in regard to um, specific issues within the current consultation suite that's in front of you this evening. Um, that that position that we're, we, we've outlined in Appendix A will be the authority's um, position statement, if you want to call it, at this time. In terms of in terms of the, the training and development side of the stuff, clearly, first up, we've probably got one of the most, um, certainly according to the WLJ, one of the most um, they would describe it as very, very thorough. But uh, thorough can also cause problems for members if they feel like the kitchen sink's being thrown at them. And uh, and this is this is the this is the trouble. Um, this is the trouble we have as officers is, is trying to find because, ironically, well-being is quite a, it is it is rightly on the on the agenda. So we we got to factor in all of that. Um, but we're also mindful of the fact that um, business the authority has to happen. So. You need a planning committee. You need a licensing committee. You need you need the quasi judicial stuff kicking in. You need the cabinet to come together. You know, and start delivering their manifesto and other things that's driving in the background of legislation and all the other challenges facing the authority. And there will be obviously the need then to get members up to speed on that. So there's always a, it's a bit of a double edged sword to get members up to, up to speed, especially if they're members who've not come from or being previously elected member and perhaps not had a massive amount of affiliation in the local government sector. So it can be a bit of a shock to the system. So we're mindful of that and we will be picking up um, refresh is post 
the the recess so in september we'll be looking to go out um councillor johnson has rightly said he's the chair of democratic services committee and i've and i've sent i sent in the draft agenda for the next next committee on there there will be things like surveys for timing of the meetings which is a requirement under the measure but also now that's being beefed up because of the new 21 act there's also things like support and training for members and we'll be looking to do that but also what we will be looking to do is doing a training needs analysis for members based on what we've done and what they feel they need extra now I'm saying all that in the context it's it's just democratic services and we have colleagues in the OD team trying to pick this up so we will need to do that in a way that's sensible because it has to fit in with everybody's work life I'm conscious that you've got family and obviously you know the constraints on members is quite significant in terms of coming along to meetings and I'm pleased to say that um members members attending you know in a hybrid meeting of or a teams meeting which is rem a remote meeting it is pleased to know because we were one of the first council to get our committee i think we were the first council to get our committees up and running this year following the elections um and we were first to get the member induction stuff up and running an issue with members kit um i know that probably isn't recognized by all members but that is a significant piece of work undertaken by a very small team um, and everybody knows Karen Bowen. She's she's the linchpin behind the scene, and she's she's a massive support for not just the team but also for me. So, I, I just want to put on record my thanks to Karen and the team for the, all the effort they put into the into the into the member development activities to date. So, we are mindful of that, um, and we are mindful of, of striking the balance in terms of of your your comment, Ian, about the role of democratic services. You're absolutely right. There is there's quite quite a significant shift in in the gear and the role of the committee, and that's why I've tried to put on there. So, for example, the um, multi-location meetings review will need to be undertaken because when we when it went to council in April this year, there was an undertaking by council back then to do a review in 12 months' time. But what I would say in terms of um, what I would say in terms of our current meeting arrangements is it is it is transparent. It is open to the public. Admittedly, the public can't attend the building at the moment. And who knows where we're going to be in, in the winter with COVID. I think it's the latest data looked at this morning from the ONS is 1 in 25. It's on the rise. Um, notwithstanding that, we're operating under interim guidance for, for meetings in any case because we don't have the statutory guidance in place um, which, which meets the requirements of the Act at the moment. So we're operating under interim arrangements. But the default position on it, on the interim guidance is that, um, you know, meetings can be held virtually. There's no requirement for every meeting to be held face to face. Um, some meetings, the council will need to decide how it how it arranges those those arrangements, and that'll be done in in the context of speaking to members as well. So um, there's a there's there's an awful lot still in train to to deal with, and um, people like Mark. Thomas, who's supporting the meeting tonight again, you know, I'm, I'm conscious that, um, you know, some of the meetings, I got two or three officers doubling up just to deal with the pressures of dealing with virtual meetings. So it's it's not easy. And and certainly um, I would I would say in fairness to colleagues, you know, certainly my director, Tom, Tom Barron is aware of where are those pressures uh, and we are actively looking at at that. But Ian, yes, you're quite right. The research, the research service. In fact, I, I, I responded back to Welsh Government and spoke, spoke to colleagues in Welsh Government around that and the issue of resourcing that because, um, you know, that that, um, that clearly, you know, again, is another shift towards, as you say, backbenches and making sure they get appropriate support. Um, I wouldn't like to think that new members think they don't get support because the support comes across a range a range of services and we pull officers in from certain areas to do certain pieces of research. I know the matter that Ian's referring to about the call, uh, the, the, the request for consideration, although I would say Ian, that, that was an outlier and I'm really sorry about that. But there, there was an awful lot of stuff going on in the background to get 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 you what you wanted. So I'll apologise for you for, for that. But I, as I said, I like to think that was that was um, that was um, an outlier as opposed to the norm. So yes, I uh, appreciate the comments. Though. Thank you. Thank you very much for that one. Um, I'm not entirely sure, Jeff, if you answered one of um, 
Councillor Lovelock Edwards' questions, which was, do you know when the survey for new members will be done? I, if you did, I apologise, but I don't, um, I don't think I heard that. The survey on training? Yes. The survey on training, we'll be look, looking to do it in the autum. So it'll be some, OK. Right, you, you, you'll be pleased to know there'll be other surveys coming to you. <laughs> which you probably won't be thankful for. So the, the, the obvious one is, is Ian alluded to, which is the time in the meetings. So that, that's yeah. a requirement of the measure, the 2011 measure. But we're yeah. the problem is, is I'm still waiting what that statutory guidance is requiring us to do. So yeah. it's always devil in the detail. I, I could have I could have um, started that process off, but then potentially having to come back to you again saying, ah, well, you know, the, the consultation now is thrown up this and uh, we no need to ask you on that. So we're just holding off on that at the moment. So if you can just bear with us, we'll, we'll, it'll be it'll be autumn winter period. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank okay. you ever so much. No problem. I mean, I can actually agree with everything that's been said so far. As a new member, yes, the training is is huge, but it's been available online. It's been timely because we have to know more to be able to operate, as you've said. Um, and I can't thank you all enough for that because I know that this authority is is doing a lot more than others. Let's just say in that area. So, so that's that's really really good. Um, do we have any other comments or any other questions? No. Okay, that's wonderful. Yeah, sure. So. I think that we're in a position now, we've considered the report, the content, the draft response. Um, we do have some comments that we want to go back to Cabinet for their consideration from Councillor Johnson um, and from Councillor Lovelock Edwards. Um, important comments, I think, about <coughs> the democratic services and how they're going to manage all of this additional work. Um, that the Welsh language does have the same priority as um, and I don't think I think that has actually been covered slightly because um, there is a section on ensuring equality and diversity, but not on the Welsh language. So that is that is important, too. Um, so I think we're at a point now then where we can refer the comments back, I think, to Cabinet for consideration. Um, so do we have a nomination so we can move on this one? I think you're on mute. Sorry, oh, love, look, sorry. Edwards. <laughs> sorry. So it's got to be I'm said. I'm happy to nominate, Chair. Yeah, thank happy you. To nominate. And, and do we have a second? I quite willingly second it. That's great. Councillor Goodjohn's got his hand up. Was it to second or was it to, to pass comment? Just a second. Oh, that's brilliant. OK. Thank you, everybody. Um, that was excellent. So if we can now move on to Project Zero update report, if Tom is in the room. Yes, he is. I hope to be in the room. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, committee <laughs> members. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for taking this report this evening. And um, this is an update report on Project Zero. Um, just by way of a little bit of background um, for members, the um, Council's Project Zero challenge plan is our response to the nature and climate emergencies that have been declared by the Council. Um, the challenge plan for Project Zero contains 18 challenges across three areas of, of activity. Um, the first being around demonstrating strong leadership, um, so us leading by example as an organisation. The second being fulfilling our responsibility to current and future generations. So there are areas where we can help shape the activities of others. Um, through our policies, the way that we deliver services and where we can have an influence on the actions of others. And the final um, of the three areas of, of work is around making a difference now. And, and that really refers to the areas that the Council has direct control over how we operate as an organisation, how we use our buildings, how we act as an employer, for example. Um, the overall aim of Project Zero is around decarbonising the Council's activities by 2030 and then contributing to the Welsh ta uh, Government target of uh, zero carbon Wales by 2050. We brought a report, Chair, to um, this scrutiny committee and to Environment and Regeneration in February of this year. Um, that was a bit of an update and stock take report and the committee's 
both asked if we could be reporting progress three times a year um, to this committee and to environment and regeneration. So this report gives you um, a bit of an update since the February um, timescale brought to your committee for pre cabinet scrutiny. So your views will then be um, referred on to scrutiny uh, to cabinet rather um, when they consider this report as well. Um, You'll note that since um, the February date and then after the elections, a section of all committee reports now has been included around climate and nature emergency implications. I think that's a really strong symbol of the Council's commitment to this agenda, that we're considering these implications alongside finance, legal, HR um, and our wellbeing of future generations obligations. So it just that's the, the kind of um, strategic context, if you like. Um, the report sets out a series of updates against um, those three areas of activity. Um, for example, within the strong leadership section, which talks around communications, engagement and evidence. Um, work has been underway with a series of community groups. We've been um, in discussions, for example, with um, Planter of Nature, um, Wenvo and Panath about how we can work collectively um, to deliver against these ambitions. We've also started to do some work um, around ensuring that all of the releases that the Council makes in terms of press statements, where there are links to Project Zero, they're very clearly articulated, as well as some physical signage in things like the country parks, for example. So um, the idea of this is that we make sure that as many people as possible are understanding what the aims are and we're working collectively to deliver them. Um, we've also um, started work on the second of the submissions to Welsh Government in terms of the data on the Council's carbon emissions. This is really important. Um, we did the first last year. Um, I think Welsh Government recognised that the process is very new um, and, and needs refinement, but it's a useful starting point for us as an organisation to really understand where our emissions are and therefore where we need to prioritise action. Um, the submission date for this year's return, which covers the 21-22 year, is just after the summer recess it's in September. So work is, is underway now um, by colleagues in the Energy Service to collate and submit that. Um, and the, the issue, I suppose, that we um, have got to grapple with as an organisation is that the vast majority of our carbon emissions are within our supply chain. Um, I know we've had discussions, Chair, around the importance of, of um, really understanding this agenda as part of our procurement strategy. Um, and I'm grateful to, to Matt, our 151 officer, who's kicked off some work in reviewing the procurement strategy to really take um, some action in this regard. Um, the second area of, of work around fulfilling our responsibility to current and future generations, um, this is, as I said, the, the area of, of the plan where we talk about um, our policy and action having influence on others. Um, there's a series of work that is, is underway here, for example, a green infrastructure strategy um, or plan rather and tree strategy have been completed and are currently undergoing internal um, consultation before they um, are opened up to wider consultation. Mm -hmm. um, committee members will be aware of the review of the local development plan um, supplementary planning guidance will accompany that in terms of taking action towards tackling climate change, as well as the use of Section 106 funding to support um, initiatives that are um, supportive of, of this agenda as well. Um, the Cardiff Capital Region is a significant um, area of work for um, South Wales. Um, members be aware of the developments around Aberthaw, for example, in terms of um, the renewable energy and um, support for developing green skills in that particular part of the Vale. And that's a significant area of, of work. And, and my colleague, um, the Director of Place, is leading on, on that work. We also talk in the, the plan around the importance of the food system. We have a very rich um, agricultural um, picture within the Vale of Glamorgan and uh, we had some um, really interesting debate when we were developing the plan about the importance of, of local food um, and how the, ensuring that people are eating well um, and eating locally and supporting the local economies is um, is good for the environment. Um, and we do that as part of the Food Vale Partnership. Um, great news that the Food Vale Partnership has, has recently been awarded the Bronze Award status as part of the Sustainable Food Places Network in recognition of, of the work underway um, in that particular regard. 
this section also talks about um, the importance of encouraging active travel and um, making sure that the infrastructure is in place for um, the charging of electric vehicles um, also for um, supporting activity that is not associated with the use of the private car. So we've got EV charging points um, being installed around 18 car parks in the county as well as the country parks. Um, the electric vehicle taxi scheme that was launched in December of last year, for example, as well as um, a series of different work um, underway to encourage um, a variety of different people to use active transport modes as well. Um, members will be aware that um, a new 10-year waste strategy um, has been reported to Cabinet recently. That will be consulted upon across the summer. Clearly, that's a massive plank um, of, of the Project Zero um, strategy in terms of how we encourage more reuse and recycling so that we um, reduce further the amount of residual waste going um, into the system. Um, so the final section of the, the report, Chair, talks about making a difference now. So the, the work that is underway um, as part of the organisation's operations and how we use our land buildings and people. Um, I mentioned the significant work around the supply chain. I've asked four colleagues at the Project Zero board to have a look within each of their areas of procurement spend to identify opportunities where they'd like to really challenge the carbon that's within those. And some of that will produce some really interesting results. Um, they're very challenging areas. How do you decarbonise domiciliary care, for example? We need to think about different ways of um, construction, um, whether that's buildings, whether that's roads, for example, um, and how we maintain those as well. Um, the report finally goes on to talk about um, the carbon reduction measures that are underway within um, a variety of different um, settings. So whether that's the council's buildings, whether that's our schools, and also whether we're working with others. And, and an example is included in the report about a, um, a new lessee who's um, taking up a premises in Penarth and is very keen to include um, energy saving measures as, as part of that agenda. Um, that probably summarises um, the, the report. There's lots and lots of activity underway across all council services because of the, the nature of this um, particular subject. So I'd be obviously delighted to take any questions um, that you or the committee have. Um, thank you ever so much for that, Tom. Um, and yes, there is, as you say, an awful lot of work going on in lots of different areas to, to try and work um, reducing our carbon emissions. We have a hand up from Councillor Franks, if you'd like to put Thank your you. question to Tom. Thank you. Um, Tom, I, I've got three topics, uh, 2.11, 2.13 and 2.16 for ease of reference for yourself. Um, one at 2.11 is um, Abathor Power Station. Um, now, I suspect um, returning members will know an awful lot about this, but uh, I don't. Um, and I see there's a, a, a list of um, aspirations, um, but I don't want to say that it seems a little bit vague, uh, but um, uh, th there's nothing um, substantial there in the report, as far as I can see, nor do I see any financial um uh, details uh, regarding 213 um the big fresh um if you say all ingredients are locally sourced i presume that doesn't mean locally grown uh we're not growing rice in uh, um bonvilleston or mickleston i suppose so what does that phrase mean locally sourced um, um and we have in Dinsborough had the OVO bikes. Um, I wouldn't mind some indication of the rate of use, and I'm sorry to say abuse of um, of the installations. Um, I, I am pleased to say that uh, they do seem to be waterproof when they come out of streams. Uh, they uh, uh, they work rideable again. Um, uh, but a disappointing note that the, the, the bike pump in Dennis Paris is repeatedly damaged. It doesn't seem very robust. Um, uh, so I wouldn't mind a comment there. And 
last but not least, 2.16. Uh, I note the, the comment on PV solar panels, but how about uh, the situation where we are assisting, say, our community centres uh, to install such panels and other partner organisations? So that those answers will take us to about uh, quarter to eight, perhaps, uh, <laughs> Tom. Perhaps, hopefully not. Thank you. I'll um, I'll do my best, um, <laughs> to to not take um, right. fifty five right. minutes to answer them. Um, in, in terms of the the reference to Aberthaw, um, that's a scheme that is being run by the Cardiff Capital Region, um, and and with your permission, Councillor Franksen and Chair, what I'll do is I'll um, I'll get some additional information shared with you on that, um, Councillor Franks. There, um, there's a series of um, press releases which give more detail than is included in a summary within this particular report um, and I can get you the latest um, situation in terms of the, the negotiations around that particular scheme. Um, okay. Thank you Tom but can I make a plea not to have a document of 147 pages uh, uh, that one yeah. officer once sent me in answer to a question. Um, I, I, a presse would be very much appreciated when two I sides of an A4 maybe. I can I can certainly um, oblige in that regard, Councillor Franks. Um, in in terms then of, of paragraph um, two thirteen, in terms of locally sourced, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, that um, that does mean that we are purchasing through local suppliers, whether that's wholesalers or whether that's producers, and it is absolutely a combination of the two. Um, I know that um, the. Big Fresh Company have made significant strides in terms of making um, connections to use local suppliers of locally produced food where that is sensible to do so, but also supporting local suppliers where it's possible to do as well. <clears throat> and actually, that's one of the benefits of us having established that local authority trading company in giving a little bit more flexibility in terms of the way that those um, items are procured. Um, in terms of the rate of use um, of OVO bikes, I know that data is available from the, the company who operate that, so I'll, I'll ask my colleagues in the transport service to, to provide that one as well. Um, and the question that you raised around community centres and the support potentially being given to them um, is actually a really timely question. I chaired a meeting um, a couple of days ago with colleagues um, as a result, actually, of um, a regular meeting I have with the chief exec of Glamorgan voluntary services. Um, we use that as an opportunity to have a discussion around the, um, the pressures, challenges and opportunities within the third sector. Um, and interestingly, it was raised with me, not necessarily from an environmental perspective, but from a um, an inflationary um, perspective in terms of the cost of energy. Um, and one of the things that um, I undertook to do was to bring some colleagues together to talk about actually how could we think about a more sustainable footing for our community centres and, and, and other community groups as a whole as a way of potentially alleviating in the medium to long term those pressures. Um, I'm very grateful to um, my colleague, the Chief Officer in, in Property Services, who's liaising with Welsh Government about some funding that may be available through um, Estadai Cymru, which is um, the National Assets um, Group in Welsh Government. And, and we're hoping to put together a bid where we would do a condition survey of the council's owned community centres. They're operated by community groups, as you as you're aware, Councillor Franks. But where we are the the landlord, to understand exactly what potential may exist for those um, community centres to have these kinds of um, initiatives installed. And I'd hope that once we have that body of evidence, we'd be able to then look for additional funding opportunities to be able to um, to support those centres. I think it's a really important one for us because ultimately these centres are the centre of, of many of our communities. They could be exemplar buildings. They could assist people in understanding and using this kind of um, new technology. So it's definitely something that we're very keen to take action on. OK, well, I look forward to uh, that further information, but no 147 page reports, please, Tom. Maximum of two sides. I hear Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Franks. Um, I'm not sure whether it was Councillor Johnson or Woods who got in there first. 
Who would like to go next? I believe Councillor Carroll has his hand up as yeah. well. Oh, Chair. and Councillor Carroll. I do apologise. I think Councillor Carroll was first. Let's let, let's have Councillor so. Carroll then. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Tom, for the presentation. It's a question in relation to the reserves that have been set up to help the Council deal with this, obviously set out in paragraph five of the report. Just a question, really, given the pressures that I think everybody's faced over the past few months, has there been any drawdown from those reserves since we last discussed this? If you could bear with me, Councillor Carroll, I will have a look um, and I'll confer with my colleague who's also on the call because we can cover that, um, if not later on in this item. I'm okay. going to specifically cover it in the finance items in a moment. Perfect, fantastic. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you much, Tom, for the um, for the report. Uh, I think um, I think it was actually during Councillor Franks's um, you know, questions there that I was considering that there, a large number of people on this call are, are quite new to the committee, um, and so it, it's perhaps worth considering what the purpose of this uh, report is doing because we had a uh, quite a detailed report in February, and the purpose of these you know, reports are to be to be summaries, I think, rather than intended to be going through the detail over and over again. I think there's probably somewhere that we need to actually have the detail set out because this is such a wide ranging um, you know, cross cutting um, you know, objective um, that touches upon everything that the council does. So I think there needs to be um, and we talked about, you know, sort of the, the train already, but uh, some some sort of, uh, you know, assurance that we can see exactly where the the actions have been taken so far up against the the objectives that they've been um, provided. Um, I've got a couple of uh, just quick points, you know, sort of whilst whilst we're a, around that, and one of those uh, is what councillor roughly what councillor Carroll was suggesting about the. Um, sort of the transparency of the money that's being spent because we got what we got in this report really is a, a list of things that are being done uh, and, and that's great um, but you know sort of I think it would be helpful to have set out okay you know sort of what is the uh, expenditure that we have allocated um, what has been spent so far um, not necessarily on a project by project basis I mean that's not the point of these these you know quarterly summaries um, they're, they're to show progress um, but to give us a bit of an indication there's not just a long list of things that um, that we're doing um, so we've had this discussion before Tom uh, where here's a long list of things that make us look great um, but you know we need to be able to see some of the the challenges that are coming in there as well so um, for example where there are changes in mowing practices and you have no mow may um, you know has there been uh, a, an increase in people complaining because some people have an idea that a uh, that a nice uh, green space is one which is kept clean and tidy rather than allowing nature to develop in its own way uh, as councillor franks has said you know what are the what's the um the pushback due to the you know the, the over bikes you know being abused you know some of that sort of i'm, I'm thinking about how this is presented to cabinets and how it's presented to us in future um you know sort of is to have some of the challenges being set out for us some of the finances set out for us so we can see you know what's being spent where is it having any sort of impact can we evidence that um, as well as just say yes we've done good things um, in terms of just just some small small bits about detail um, two points I'd like to pick up there's a passing reference oh, there's three points really one is that there's a passing reference in here to the local nature partnership um, I appreciate this isn't the environment and regeneration committee but I think it would be helpful somewhere um, to have the work of the LNP and also the local places for nature uh, work that we undergo and we, we're participating in as a council you know, set out for us um, the other is, I, I think I just like a little bit of reassurance about the time scale for the uh, the carbon uh, footprint work that's being undertaken. I think the original intention was to complete that by the end of June. And I know that CRF um, uh, monies have, have slipped in some cases. I don't know if that's if we're still on on target for that and to um, report in September. Uh, and the third point I'd like to make just is that there's uh, uh, within our strategy there's passing reference to to blue spaces. Um, you know, rivers, uh, streams. Uh, we're one of Wales's um, 15 maritime local authorities. We have the Wales Coastal Monitoring um, you know, uh, Group here in, in the Vale. I'm just wondering, you know, sort of whether there's any work that we've undertaken or planning to undertake uh, in our coastal waters, you know, sort of off 
uh, off the coast of the Vale of Morgan because we 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 talk about nature and we uh, and we often think about uh, whether it's birds, butterflies, it, 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 flowers, etc. Um, but obviously the um, the the, you know, the seven uh, has one of the highest intertidal uh, ranges in the world, and it, so it was quite unique. So I'm wondering if we're doing any work, you know, sort of on that basis. Uh, thank you much, Chair. Thank you much, Tom. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Um, I think I also picked up on this point. So, you know, this is all useful information for Tom to take back and and possibly refocus these um, reports that we get um, three times a year so that we can see progress against the plan. We can see timelines. Um, obviously, I'm new to, to chair, so I wasn't in the last meeting where you might have seen this first report. Um, and it was something I thought of. Is this all new? Is this all something that's happened within the last couple of months or not? So um, it was a thought of mine as well. So thank you for bringing that up, Councillor Johnson. Um, and we've also got Councillor Wood, who is very patiently waiting. So I do apologise. Please, please okay, well, have, your, have your say. Thank you, Chair. I'll keep it brief. Um, just a couple of questions for Tom. Um, obviously, with this issue, time is of the essence. If 2030 is a is a target. It sounds a very long way away, but time can run away with itself. Um, does Tom consider that we have the, enough resource within the council to, full, to, to take every plan that we come up with forward? And beyond that, how much benchmarking, once we have a, uh, a structure of the carbon emissions within the veil, um, how much benchmarking is done against other councils in this in in this situation? Because obviously there are things that are unique to every council, but there's also a lot of lo low hanging fruit. But we we need to make sure that we really approach this in a very strategic manner. Otherwise, 2030 will be upon us. And um, whilst we have lots of nice things that we're doing, we have to make sure that we really tackle this in in a very very con quick and constructive manner. Thank you, Councillor Wood. Um, in, in terms of answering the, the second question first, if I if I may, in terms of the data return that is made to Welsh Government, there absolutely is then a um, cross-public sector working group um, which we contribute to, looking at um, the data that comes out. It's also then broken down into um, local authority level as well, so we can compare um, ourselves against um, others. And, and that's not necessarily in terms of a league table, but exactly as you suggest, in terms of opportunities to learn and share good practice. So um, that work is, is underway. Um, in terms of have we got enough resource to deliver all the plans that um, that we set ourselves as, as an organisation? Um, I would say that um, the plan is put together with both an aspirational um, element, but also the realism that actually, yes, in, in seven and a half years time, we need to be meeting this, this goal. Um, we have reviewed the, the level of resource that's available in some of the key areas to enable this activity to happen. Um, so, for example, we've invested within the Council's energy service this current year. Um, we're doing that in, in a couple of different ways, both with some technical expertise and capacity, um, really to be able to crunch the numbers and then be able to interpret what the numbers are, are telling us so we can identify action. And also um, it, within that team to also focus in on some of the community inf information and, and engagement work, um, very much being aware that this is not a plan just for the council to deliver. Um, so it is an area that, um, that we do identify resource pressures and where we need to take action. I'd also make the point that Project Zero is not something that is being delivered by one team within one area of the council. It requires the collective action across all of our council services. So through things like the corporate um, service planning process, we identify the activities that should be core business now and different ways of working in order to contribute to this. So um, it's both dedicated resource, but also a collective effort um, towards meeting the goals. OK, um, if I could just ask then, where would I go to find um, a, a catalogue of working practices or plans that may have been altered in the last year or so to try to meet these meet these aspirations? Is there a is there a, a, a catalogued document of such a thing? I, we I, I would 
would point you, councillor, to initially to the challenge plan, which sets right. out um, the 18 challenges that yeah. um, that we're needing to to take, and, and each of those challenges has got a senior responsible officer. What we have then um, done is reflect those challenges in within each of the council services service plans. Um, so you can see then the actions that are being taken across. Um, I think we've got 16 service areas, but don't quote me. Um, so you can see what all of those services are doing to contribute back to those challenges. So that's where you'll see those um, particular details. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Wood. Thank you, um, Tom. Um, Councillor Carroll? Um, sorry, thank you. Apologies, Chair. Um, just a quick one again. It's just um, a, an additional point in relation to my earlier question, Tom. Would it be possible to up, include an update on any drawdown in future reports were it to take place? It's just then rather than cross referencing against against other reports it would be easier just to have it in here so that it's um easier to identify absolutely councillor carroll um i, I think it, it the the contribution from from yourself councillor johnson obviously the chair has been really useful in in understanding this is the first of yeah. these three times a year update it's great to have the um the input from elected members in terms of how you'd like to see the information structured and presented. So certainly not a problem at all um, for us to be able to, to look at that. What I will do is um, undertake, Chair, to circulate some details of the current financial balances and any draw down since the beginning of the financial year um, to committee members after this meeting. Um, and we will then definitely, Councillor Carroll, put um, a summary within subsequent reports so you can see that. Um, and also the, the Point that Councillor Johnson made around looking at um, articulating some of the challenges and barriers that we're seeing in this agenda. Absolutely, um, I mean, we maintain um, a risk and issue log as part of the board arrangements. That's um, a, an obvious thing that we can draw out of in order to summarise some of the things that we're we're having to discuss. Yeah, no, the only reason I um, I say that is obviously resources and finance are probably the main part of this committee's remit. So if we could have a simple outline of any spending that has taken place, I think that would be would be helpful. Thank you, thank Councillor you. Carroll. Um, Councillor Johnson. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Just, just very quickly, I just wanted to come back on, I think, some of the comments from uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Wood just then about the um, the provision of information. I think there's, there's, there's a fair amount of information that's on the uh, the Vale Council's external facing uh, website, which I think it would be helpful for people to uh, just have a look at. But I wanted just to draw attention really to tonight's um, agenda paperwork because we've got a lot of background papers on there, um, but they seem to be taking us to um, to minutes of meetings in many cases, rather than taking us to the agenda item. Um, and often, I think Tom would agree with me that the agenda item is usually a presentation um, and that's all, therefore not very really included within the paperwork. So I think if there's a way of um, you know, sort of tracking back the paperwork and the presentations so that they're easily available uh, in one place, then that will help us with being able to track um, you know, decision making and changes as, as they've gone by. Um, because, I mean, I, I, if you click on stuff at the bottom of this, then it takes you to a, a set of minutes which tell you nothing other than we had a discussion. So just and a you know, suggestion for that for future. Thank you very much, Councillor Johnson. Um, Again, you have echoed my thoughts because before this meeting, I tried to have a look at uh, at the report from February um, and I got to the cabinet report, which was over a thousand pages of information. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I don't know where to go. So, yes, it would be fantastic if there was, you know, an IT solution so that we could easily access the bits that we that we need. So thank you for bringing that up, Councillor Johnson. I can certainly do that. Wonderful. Um, OK, do we have any other questions? On this quite important topic for, for Tom? No, OK. Um, so um, we're at the point now where we're going to note the progress detailed in the report. Um, we have got comments, so I hope that they've been noted. There are a couple of documents that Tom's going to produce. A summary 
for Councillor Franks and the rest of us on Aberthaw Power Station and the works to, that's going on there. Um, I think also he asked for some data on the use of e-bikes, if that was possible. Um, I think Councillor Carroll wanted some updates on the finances relevant to our projects on um, decarbonisation. Um, and I think some of the aspects of this may be covered now in the, in the following reports to do with revenue monitoring and capital monitoring, but we'll, but we'll see. Um, I think that was it. Was there anything else that we picked up? I don't think so. Anyway, so well, we recommend sorry. then. Oh, hang on. I've got another hand. Thank you, Councillor oh, Johnson. Sorry, Chair. I mean, I, I did ask um, Tom uh, for a little bit more information, perhaps. And I don't know whether it's a right now or a later on regarding um, the local nature partnership and local place of nature and how we're engaging with that. And also regarding yeah. our use of um, blue spaces. Uh, also, Chair, I, mean, I, I don't know, you know so whether this is um, uh, uh, permissible in the in the time allowed but i mean the i think some of we as a uh, as a committee we we i think we've drawn attention to some you know some shortcomings in in sort of in the uh, in the presentation of this um you know mm -hmm. sort of as a, as a report you know in terms of um you know sort of in terms of how the progress is is being checked in terms of the ability of the finances um I, it's up to up to, to tom and, and and yourself chair as to whether there's enough time to to make any of those changes i know the leaders on on the call with us today and uh, whether mm. where, where those changes should be made before it goes to cabinet because i mean that's the the point there's no point in pre-scrutiny if we're just going to um have the same thing going to cabinet with the same um you know queries and issues so i don't know whether that's something that, that you want to discuss now or just yeah. whether tom yeah. wants to send uh, the report forward and then change it in future format yeah tom is it possible to make some of these changes before this goes up to cabinet or shall we what's your view i think I think um, it, it would be very useful um, for your committee chair to make that recommendation up to cabinet that it um, that future reports include that information yeah. in that format. I am conscious, though, um, Councillor Johnson, that this report is going to the Environment and Regeneration Scrutiny Committee, but because Afterwards, of the weight yeah. of their agenda, it's not going until September. So I was going to suggest that some of the information around local, local nature partnerships and blue space could potentially be provided as an addendum to to that committee because it it sits within the terms of reference quite neatly with with that committee but certainly in terms of um the reference to cabinet i'll have a discussion with democratic services colleagues around adding an appendix to the report which sets out the um the financial drawdown um that that's relatively straightforward for us to be able to to do and as you suggest councillor would be good for them to see um in terms of then the wider structural changes to the report in terms of some of those challenges and barriers with your permission, I think it would make sense that we look at the totality of the presentation or the format of the report. That would be great. Um, so we do that after the summer recess. Which would be great. Um, and if we can look at the timelines of the things that we're looking at as well, I think that was quite uh, quite an important comment because we are all on a journey with this one and we are working towards in the next couple of years, hopefully making progress, which we want to be able to to have assurances that we're making those progresses. Um, and we have another hand. Councillor Lovelock Edwards, would you like to speak? Thank you, Chair. It's just a point to uh, uh, seek it, uh, for clarification. Are, are we just saying that um, similar to other reports where the progress is, is aligned to almost a traffic light system? Is is that the format that's being proposed? It's not quite clear to me in, in terms of the, the structure of the document. Um, just as a newly elected councillor, it would help me to know sort of what we are actually, what you're seeking in terms of uh, agreement from in terms of um, recommendations to go back in terms of format because it seems that I, I would rather have something that is consistent and aligned with other committees in terms of their reporting back yeah yes i mean on a personal note i'm also in agreement with councillor lovelock edwards if we can have time bound rag rating for the the elements of projects for the different directorates that we're looking at that would be helpful i think um how does everybody else feel about that yeah, it's easier for everybody to understand then what's going on, when it should be happening, and if we don't quite uh, hit those um, those timelines and milestones, isn't it? 
Uh, just very quick one, Chair, as well. Um, did you mm -hmm. want the comment added in as well that Councillor Johnson raised about um, the use of links in the body of the report as well, uh, moving more perhaps to presentations and the main reports themselves as opposed to the, the minutes then of the of the reports? Is that something you yeah. want to look at in future as well? Yeah, I don't think it's specific to to this particular issue it's right. it's across all issues isn't it that yeah. of us being able to if possible with the use of it go straight to the parts of things that we yeah. need to rather than try and find it in big reports okay it may, maybe it should come under like the, the the more general point about the structure of the reports going yes. forward maybe as an as an example as another sort of way of structuring yeah. the report then thanks chair thanks committee that's great um, wonderful then. So are we clear how we are progressing with this one now? Yes, hopefully. Wonderful. Um, so we recommend that the considerations and the amendments be made to the report before it goes to Cabinet. Um, and then any further comments will come back to Cabinet with recommendations um, before it's distributed to all members, PSB, Town Councils, um, and that's that. So can we have a nomination, please, to move on this? I'll move that. Thanks ever so much. And can we have a seconder? I'm oh, second happy to second. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we're next then moving on to revenue monitoring um, April 22 to the 31st of March 2022. Um, is it Matt or Gemma who's leading on this one? Matt. Uh, yeah, wonderful. I came along to the agenda uh, conference meeting, but I'll be supporting this scrutiny committee during the course of the year. And apologies, I wasn't able to make the, the earlier meeting. Um, we're trying to share the scrutiny meetings out across yeah. the, the entire <laughs> team. So, um, so there, there's actually two finance reports on on the agenda um, this evening. Um, and what we've done, we've split um, the, the finance report from last year into two. So we're taking separate reports on finance and capital and I've done that for um, one, a couple of reasons. But the main one is I, I feel sometimes that capital gets a little bit short shrift. It's often on the back of a revenue report at the end of it um, and it doesn't end up having the um, full discussion that it needs to. Um, and especially capital, that's that's investment in the veil and it's really important um, that it has that consideration. Um, a general comment about both reports. <clears throat> it's obviously very early in, in the year, um, and, but these are uh, badged as first quarter, but actually they're the first two months, aren't they? They're, they're based on the uh, financial information to the end of um, up to 31st of May. So they're both very much um, a heads up report. The other thing I've done in it, um, hopefully chimes with some of the comments that we've seen earlier th this evening, um, Accessibility of financial information is um, really um, important to me um, and I'll talk about that in a couple of instances with, with these reports. But first off, the other thing we've done uh, with both of these reports last year, this year rather, in previous years, we'd have just um, produced these reports for Cabinet in, in um, full um, and just taken excerpts of them to the scrutiny meetings. Um, for me, it's really important for all members that you understand the full context of the the, um, the council's spending. So we're putting the full cabinet reports in, in front of all the scrutiny committees this cycle, um, but then asking that you certainly focus and certainly with your questions on on the relative areas, the, you know, the relevant areas for this, this um, particular um, committee. So that's a, a couple of general points for, for both of them. So um, specifically on the the revenue report, um, it is early days. Um, we are experiencing some initial pressures in, in children's services, and that's around placement and uh, costs and counts of legal services in, in supporting that process. And um, some specific um, financial pressures on our leisure services contract and the operating costs um, being incurred at this time. Um, and those are in the order of about half a million pounds um, that we're reporting. And they are uh, primarily because of increasing um, utility costs and additional costs that the leisure services uh, contract providers been experiencing um, throughout um, 
COVID and we're, we're just starting to see some return to mo- normality with, with that particular contract. Um, the What the report doesn't do um, and that we're all all too aware of at the moment is the inflationary pressures um, that are being experienced um, both in revenue and capital. Um, on the revenue front, um, there will be more on those in the um, the quarter two report that you'll see in October. Um, and they will, um, unfortunately, some of those pressures will be coming through on utilities. The, the, the positive news is, is that the council has protected itself by in that it's purchased um, gas and electricity two years in advance. Uh, but what we've seen, and all councils in Wales, the majority of councils, if not all, are on the um, same framework, is that the providers altered standing charges. So we're seeing standing charges coming through whilst the actual unit rates have been held. Um, And that's looking like um, putting through a pressure of in the order of 300k. Um, So we'll report more on that next time round. Also, um, in terms of inflation, there's likely to be some protracted uh, discussions on pay awards uh, for 22-3 and we all know how late in the year they were agreed last year in in perhaps more stable conditions than we're operating in um, currently. Um, So there's certainly a lot of pressure, there will be a lot of pressure to um, increase the um, uh, real living wage and um, pressure on the lower grades in, in our pay scales. Um, and just writing those will, will cost a couple of percent in themselves. So um, I suspect the 3% that we put in the budget uh, for pay awards uh, for 2022-3 won't be um, sufficient, sufficient and we will likely um, see some pressures coming through there later in the year. Um, the other, next thing I was going to say is just a general comment um, and that's on the table in 28 um, and talking to Gemma whilst we were preparing these reports and um, following agenda planning and when I'd said I said I would cover this particular um, committee, there, there are some elements that um, I'm not 100% happy with myself in the way in which we're presenting and actually they impact most greatly on this committee um, and that's because um, all of the costs uh, of corporate resources are recharged across all the service areas. So in the table in front of you in um, in that, that, that paragraph 2.8, you have resources at a net cost of 983k and housing benefits at 692k. Um, that really doesn't give a clear picture of the, the amount of resources that the council's putting into to either of those areas. Um, there's a total spend in resources of 19 million pounds per annum and um, gross spend of just short of 30 million in housing benefits. So when we come back in October with, with these reports, um, we're possibly going to have gross expenditure and income in there, or I might just strip out the recharges and show um, that the management accounts, i.e. the controllable spend um, where they are. So there, there's a couple of tweaks and changes I'd, I'd like to be making um, to this report in any case. Um, and as I said, I'm, um, accessibility of financial information is really important to me. So here this evening or outside the meeting, I'm, I'm always um, open to comments from colleagues about how we can improve our financial reporting to you. Um, in terms of resources specifically, then, in um, this res- uh, report, there aren't any new um, emerging resource uh, pressures. And this is... Um, paragraphs 2.29 onwards. Um, There are, however, some underlying pressures in the corporate resources budget um, that Tom and I and colleagues are discussing and looking to resolve. Um, And at the moment, they're being masked to some extent um, by vacancies in the service. So overall, as a directorate, we're we're in balance, um, but it is being that is being driven by by vacancies in in the services. I know earlier this evening we have talked a little bit about resources and delivering plans, um, and it's certainly the, the case that those um, vacancies are causing pressures in our services, and we, we do need to recruit to those posts long term. So we're having discussions about how we drive further efficiencies 
um, in in the directorate. So that's ongoing discussion. The um, other part of the, the report that's um, relevant to this committee is the policy section. Um, at the moment, uh, we're reporting a neutral position on there as well. Um, colleagues who've been at the council um, previously will know this is an area that we um, typically have some measure of underspend in. Um, and whilst I've only been here three months myself, I know from other councils I've worked at, these are sort of some of the budgets um, that do help balance the overall budget by the time you get to, to year end. Um, so there's two particular areas in policy that are, are worthy of mention. Um, and in this area that's about £34 million sits all of our capital financing costs. Um, so the assumptions that we're making about um, borrowing and financing for the capital programme assumes that the capital programme is delivered in full. And we'll talk a little bit about that, more about that in the next report. Um, it's very unlikely, isn't it? Um, so I would expect that, we're, that we'll see some upside on our Treasury budgets at year end. The other sort of um, perennial budget that helps out is the um, council tax collection. Um, this council's had a really good record on council tax recovery in, in the past and is um, well stacked in the, in, the, you know, in the overall pack of local Welsh local authorities in, in its recovery. Um, so I would, I would, in a normal year, I'd probably be saying I'd expect to see some upside in there, but we all know the impact that um, the cost of living crisis is, is having. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll keep my counsel on that area a little bit longer and see when we get towards the end of the summer and early um, autumn, how our actual uh, collection rates are, are looking. Uh, so those are the those are the key headlines that I wanted to to share with you from the revenue report, and and more than happy to take any um, questions or observations that you might have. I would like actually very quickly just to pick up on Councillor Carroll's point as well. Um, I don't have that information in front of me to share with you this evening, but as uh, Tom said, we'll go ahead and have a look at it. I'll also have a think about in our um, revenue report whether we can have a little bit more transparency on the reserves and how we're drawing those down in, in the course of the year as well. Thank you. That's great. Thank you ever so much for that, uh, Matt. Yes, the cost of living crisis and yes, come the autumn when fuel um, gas goes up another 65, I think 65% they're saying, aren't they? I mean, who knows what pressures that's going to put on individual households and whether you won't have quite so many people paying their council tax uh, on time. I don't know. Something's got to give, hasn't it? Um, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Matt, for, for the presentation there. It's, um, uh, it's always very good to read detailed um, financial reports. They, they are, you know, I think, very helpful. Um, a couple of, of, of just quick points. Um, and firstly, I think there's um, some things that the Council have done uh, which are, I think, very important. So the commitment to paying the real living wage is something that's very important. I know we have prevaricated on that for um, for a period of time. So I'm glad to see that finally being uh, introduced now. Uh, also, the commitments regarding um, free school meals um, for, for, for infant children, I think, is, is very important as well. Um, you re Obviously, it's early in the year and recognise that there's an awful long time um, to come. Uh, I think one of the issues that's challenged me uh, as a member of this committee over the years is the sort of the magic money tree. Um, that appears towards you know, midway through the year and then then at year end um, where, it, where Welsh government or ourselves managed to find you know sort of additional um, pockets of funding that uh, we were told earlier in the year were, were not available and we were at, uh, we were going to be stretched in many ways. So I think what would be helpful for me is just you know sort of assurances as we go through the year that this is you know, to our best knowledge and uh, as you've said regarding um, you know sort of the council tax collection you know where that uh, where we hedge those those bets. Um, my experience of, of, of this council over <laughs> over the last decade, and I don't know uh, if others would would agree or disagree. We've we've had this discussion before. Is that we you know we tend to roughly hit our um, our collection rate, which has traditionally been set around ninety seven and a half or ninety seven percent in year, um, but we then end up with a uh, uh, with a, a surplus as a result of collection from uh, the previous year. So that catch up figure then I think is what's generally provided us um, with uh, a little bit extra, you know, it's around two million pounds extra usually, um, you know, per annum, um, which is a uh, which is difficult to 
always you know rely upon but also important to consider that our you know our collection rates have generally been uh, around that and only dipped during the the coronavirus year when of course uh, Welsh government stepped in and, and and filled in a lot of the gaps um I think the the pressures that you you pointed to specifically regarding um utilities and regarding um, wage inflation which is I think you know sort of quite well deserved by our staff who've obviously have it up with a very long time in the public sector without large uh, without you know sort of you know, genuine cost of living increases over the last 10 15 years um is uh, things that are going to be quite quite general across local authorities. So um, uh, while I, I recognise that there may be some areas where, you know, for example, with our neighbourhood services where we've got uh, issues that uh, relate to, um, you know, to our our collection and to the way the service operates. Um, when it comes to utilities, when it comes to uh, wages, when it comes to social services, um, those are generally Wales-wide pressures. Um, and you know, sort of, I always look forward to hearing back from you know, from Welsh government as to how they're going to help local authorities meet those. They obviously set the set the formula and and provide us with an amount. Um, so I think I'd be interested to hear from you know, from you, Matt, as as the months go by, um, you know, where negotiations are, um, because we won't be the only local authority um, feeling those pressures. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, um, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Carroll. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Matt, for um, agreeing to provide that information. And also thank you for um, suggesting more information will be provided on the reserves as well. I think that's an excellent idea and really grateful to you for that. Just a question in relation to the investment position and the borrowing position. Just wanted to ask what the anticipate, what you anticipate any impact of interest rate rises may be on either the costs of borrowing for the authority or yields on investments. So we, <clears throat> our, our treasury team is supported um, by a, a third party um, advisor. Um, we meet in with those on a, a monthly basis as a, as a team. Um, it's, it's one of those areas that is a little bit too early to, to call at this stage, um, but it is one I'd like to reassure you that we're really focused on yeah. um, and it's it's really important. It, it's really strange after 13 years of not seeing the interest yes. rates high to suddenly talk about how much they're going to rise by, not just whether if they are going to um, rise. Thank you. I'll watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Could I just come back on a couple of the points that um, Councillor Johnson raised as well? Please do. Please do. Just on the um, the sort of the mythical magical money tree, um, we uh, you know you have my commitment on um, reserves, council tax that we'll be opening in those um, the reporting in those areas and bring it to your attention and to cabinet as soon as we're we're aware. I think that the big thing that I'm seeing. Um, having just moved back to Wales, um, is the the continual stream of grants um, and this continual stream of grants coming through very late in the year. Um, I would say, um, number one, they're really welcome. However, it would be nice to know a little bit earlier um, because it does um, naturally give some, some challenges with um, planning. Um, and then on the um, utilities, um, and this is another sort of England Wales um, contrast, actually. Um, I had my first in person meeting with um, Society of Welsh Treasurers in Clemden Dodd Wells uh, end of last week. Um, it was a really good meeting, and I was really pleasantly surprised. Um, and whilst it was on a team session, that we had the Welsh Finance Minister talking to us and being part of that meeting. So lots of opportunities um, for that group um, to, to lobby and well supported by the Welsh LGA as well. Um, so we'll, we'll be taking every opportunity we can to individually lobby and collectively uh, to make sure that we have the right funding to support us at these, these difficult times. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Matt. Um, I understand that, that grants come through quite often later in the day and with short notice to spend the money and that is very difficult but but I also understand that Welsh Government are 
trying to react to crisis after crisis and that's why they're so late sometimes coming through but but i i do agree they do sometimes do this to us and we can't not be able to spend this money it's uh it's almost a criminal act not to be able to isn't it um anybody else got any questions i can see there's a hand there who's that one councillor good, good, good job please go hi. ahead um hi thank you chair um Simply going on the point from the report, um, you mentioned how you have separated the corporate performance, most of the corporate performance money uh, into separate sections um, and that you will be rectifying that. Um, but most of the adverse uh, in the budget seems to be coming from um, in the report, if I've gotten this right, uh, seems to be a shortfall in savings found from corporate performance, um, something around half a million pounds. Um, just asking if you are intending on reviewing uh, how much you're intending to say from corporate performance as you have historically um, at all, or if that is a reasonable amount of uh, adverse that you're expecting. So yeah, the the, the plan is that, that we address that in the year um, and that we don't rely on the, the vacancies to, to help us balance the, the budget. Um, I haven't talked too much about um, 23-4 or 24-5 the next couple of years, um, but we are obviously as a team starting to look forward um, with our planning for the, the medium term financial plan. And what we need to make sure of is that we have a really sound base going forward so that we do address these underlying issues in the budget now. Um, it's very clear that whilst we had a good settlement for 22-3, and actually um, there are indicative figures that have been shared uh, for 23-4, 24-5. Certainly the message we were having from the, the finance minister Friday before last was that's probably it. Um, and, and don't rely on additional resources on top of that coming forward in, in the new year. So it, it's really important that we, we get to grips with the budget that's in front of us. Thank you. And anybody else with anything else? No? That's great. OK, then. So um, we've considered the position. Can we move on this? Can I have a nomination? Anybody? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Good John and Lovelock Edwards. And do we have a seconder? Thank you very much. Right then, so let's move on to the Chair, yes. Just to double check, um, just to make sure, committee, you're happy to note um, the position with regard to the authorities' revenue budget. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, we Lovely. are. Lovely. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. Um, on to the next um, item on the agenda then, which is the capital monitoring. Um, again, for the same period, April 22 to the 31st of May 2022. So it's back to Matt for this one. Yeah. So if it's early year for revenue monitoring it's, it's very very early in the in the year for capital um so i'm just going to just say a, a few brief words in the introduction of this report very much the the big challenge um here will be delivering um this program um it's at eight, 107 million pounds um and that's in part because of the um the slippage that's been brought from forward from 21 to financial year as well. Um, so typically the, the council probably delivers a capital program about 60, 70 million pounds. Um, and again, again, I, I guess a comment going to back to um, Tom's earlier item on, on the agenda. It, it's fair to say that colleagues and services are obviously optimistic at the time, start of the year that they're able to deliver these um, programs um, and they're, they're quite reticent about um, forecasting that they won't deliver certainly this early in the year um, and um, we don't see that much slippage being taken forward at this time. Um, I can assure you by the time we get to the October report um, we'll, we will have a very different uh, report in, in front of us and we're working uh, quite extensively with all the service managers at the moment. Um, we're Basically, the, the piece of work we're doing with them is uh, three or four questions. Um, we're obviously asking them about the impact of the inflationary pressures on their schemes. But then we were asking them about, are you already on site? Do you have your contracts agreed or are you just out for tender? 
so we want to be able to come back in in October with a really realistic um, position um, in front of us. And obviously that's important for me as well. And the team being able to, to forecast what our treasury costs are going to be. The, um, we are seeing the, the impact of inflation um, already. Um, and I know talking to colleagues across the council, um, they are having to uh, value engineer schemes uh, to keep them within the cost envelopes that have been agreed as part of the, the capital programme. Um, so the, the council is doing everything it can to deliver the programme to to the uh, to the agreed cost. This that's just the general stuff in terms of resources specifically. There's only really one major scheme, and that's the um, implementation of the new financial and HR system oracle. Uh, fusion um, that's um, likely very likely to go live early autumn September October time um, what we have done is put money aside resource aside for the archiving element of that scheme but it was held in revenue it is actually a cost capital cost in terms of the solution that's been proposed um, so that's been now brought into that this programme. So that's the only really main change at this time of the year for um, resources. Uh, but we'll report more in October on, on the total cost of that Oracle implementation and it should be coming certainly to a close uh, around that time. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Any comments? Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, I think matters um, you know, touched on, on most of the points that I would expect him to refer to there. This is a phenomenally large list of, of works um, that perhaps suggests that um, you know, we, were, we were biting off more than we could chew uh, in the first place. There's a lot of slippages from 2021-22 uh, into the current year uh, and obviously now running into an awful lot of headwinds as we've seen with you know, Atlantic Trading State etc when it comes to um, you know, to supply chain issues, to um, to getting contractors in. Um, you were talking about uh, October, but obviously the summer holiday is the time when I think most of the uh, school's work is undertaken, and there's an awful lot of uh, that in you know the start of the you know the appendix here. I mean, what what sort of um, confidence do we have that um, that that work has gone out to tender, been successful and is likely to have, you know, people um, conducting this work, uh, you know, sort of over the summer months. Actually, there are some things here which, you know, you can allow, you know, whether it's you know, some form of slippage, but obviously if things that are timetabled for the summer in schools don't happen, then, you know, you, you, you know, when do those, when are those works likely to take place, if at all, in this financial year? Yeah. So the, the, the schools maintenance program actually sits with my team properties, part of the, the overall finance um, service. Um, and I was speaking to that operational manager um, mid last week about the whole program of work across the summer. Um, it is generally positive news that we've agreed contracts for the majority of the work. I think there were just uh, a couple of weeks ago, just a couple of tenders that were still outstanding. Um, so I'm positive that we'll have a good um, program of works undertaken in in the schools across the summer, and I'm hopefully I'll be saying that back in October when I when I see you again here. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Councillor Wood. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, looking at the table on which is it, uh, page four, where we've got the approved program, 107 million. Yeah. Yeah, you said you said quite a lot of that is constituted as well with stuff that has been delayed from the previous financial year. Have yeah. you got any indicative increase in costs, particularly for those older contracts? Because inputs have gone up 20 to 30 percent in some cases. And my only concern there is we're looking at 107 million. But if for some of those older contracts, the, the, the slippage could be really, really, really high. Do you have any indicative numbers from contractors or contracts or has there only been any renegotiation requested by, by by contractors for that type of thing? So um, the simple answer is I, I don't have visibility of of that, um, but that's something I can, I can certainly have a discussion with, with colleagues and, and bring you next time round or, or maybe actually just put an email or something around the, the committee members. Uh, but it's a, it's a really good point. Um, we're obviously managing it 
in the round and and some of those um the the programs that have slipped are, are probably some of the ones that we're having to value engineer now to make sure that they they fit the original budget it's just yeah it's just from my experience costs of inputs from two years ago to today for basic capital inputs have increased enormously and i just would you know we, we say we're going to get to october but we have an approved program which number may 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 be impossible to value engineer it and it may jump could jump quite considerably that's my concern there yeah okay do we have any other questions from anybody no okay that's great um so matt then if you can try and get back to us with uh, some information on program slippages and also where we've identified increased costs yeah. in um, in the project's delivery. That would be really, really helpful. Um, and I think then if we don't have any more questions, we can note that the progress is being made yeah. and especially with regard to our particular schemes. Um, also, there's a number of other things to note on here. There was a list of delegated authorities um, emergency powers and also the changes to the capital program mm. that's been outlined within this report. So if we're all happy to note this, can yes. we have a nomination to move on that? Yeah. Was that happy a hand? Second. Councillor Wood? Yes. That's a <laughs> hand, yes. Sorry, I was on yeah. mute there for a second, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. And who's the seconder? Did I hear? Uh, happy to second, Councillor Hanks. Thank you, Councillor Hanks. That's great. Wonderful. Um, OK, so it is quarter to eight. I know it's hot, but we do have one last agenda item, which is uh, quite a meaty one. So with no further ado, it's back to Tom with the annual delivery plan monitoring report. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll do my best, Chair, not to um, to keep you to, um, too long, but um, this report is the, as you say, quarter four end of year performance report. Um, ordinarily, elected members would receive in quarters one, two and three a composite report um, that is presented to all scrutiny committees of the performance during that quarter. Because we're at the end of year um, stage of, of performance monitoring, that full information will be included within the Council's annual self-assessment report, which we'll be bringing to Governance and Audit Committee, Cabinet, all scrutiny committees, and then on to full Council um, in the autumn, uh, running up to the November Council meeting. So this time, um, it's a bit of an interim report because I'm always conscious that if we wait until September or October, it, it feels very late into the, the year to be reporting end of year performance. So that's the reason for, for the report um, coming in this format this time. Um, for um, committee members um, awareness, the report is um, has got three appendices. The first is um, a presentation which is associated with the terms of reference of your committee chair. Um, Appendix B is the exception report. So that I, um, highlights those actions or measures which have slipped and been attributed a red brag status. And then finally, um, you've got all of the detail within um, Appendix C, which is within the terms of reference of your committee. So that's just for complete transparency um, and, and shows you in effect the workings as to how we got to um, the conclusions that we've drawn. Um, if it's useful, Chair, I can walk you through the presentation, which is Appendix A to the report, if that's... Yeah, that would be great. Cool. Thank you, Tom. So if you bear with me, I'll just share my screen a moment. Can I just double check that that's sharing for you OK? Yeah. Great. Great stuff. Um, so the first slide here is showing you the overall status of the annual delivery plan for 21-22 across all four of the council's wellbeing objectives. Um, it's showing that um, all four objectives have been given an overall RAG status of green, demonstrating the progress that has been made. Um, members will note that the actions are overall rated green. Um, there is some minor slippage against some of the performance indicators in objectives one, three and four, which is what um, associates um, a, an amber status. But overall, when considered holistically, um, we're judging that as being a green status for the delivery of last year's annual delivery plan. Um, and this slide here just showcases some of the um, some of the 
things that have been achieved. And I'm just going to try and make that slightly bigger for members. Um, so showing on this screen, broken down by the, the wellbeing objectives and within the remit of your committee um, chair, within objective one, um, there's some information here around the reach that the council's social media has, um, has gathered in the year, as well as the number of subscribers to Vale Connect, that's the bulletin service by email to residents, which has grown in the year to 84,500. Um, some important work has been underway in terms of the equality sphere. Um, I was really pleased that we were able to take part in Race Awareness Week um, during 21-22 for the first time. We were a spotlight organisation working um, in order to really showcase the work that the Council's doing and an important meeting with the Council's strategic leadership team and representatives from our um, Black um, and minority ethnic um, staff network took place as part of a safe space um, initiative that's led to the identification of some actions that we will now take going forward in order to make the Vale of Glamorgan Council an um, even more inclusive place to work. Um, we've got some work underway um, within um, my colleague Tracy's area in terms of HR championing um, well-being and so how colleagues are supporting one another um, with activities such as um, woodland walks um, and other wellbeing initiatives in order to support people and make sure that they still continue to feel connected to the organisation. We've also kicked off some work about the future ways of working um, looking at how do we make um, changes in terms of the use of office accommodation, how do we harness the power of digital technology and connectivity, but importantly, how do we make sure that we support staff and members in doing that? Um, and there's also finally within Objective 1 some data there around the performance of the customer contact centre as well as the internal IT service desk um, in terms of resolution times. Objective two, which is around supporting learning, employment and sustainable economic growth. Just highlighting here some of the work that the Money Advice team have continued to do. Um, this is obviously increasingly important given some of the pressures that you were just discussing as a committee, um, but more so in terms of the impact that it's having on our citizens around the cost of living. We're also doing some work around Vale Heroes, which was the initiative that the Council launched during the pandemic about how do we link up community groups, third sector organisations and the public sector in order to provide support to our residents for a variety of different needs. Um, I'm chairing a cost of living huddle group where I'm bringing together people from across the organisation to look at what we're already doing to tackle the cost of living crisis, but importantly, what more can we do? And looking to repurpose the Vale Heroes brand um, in order to share some of that information um, more broadly. And it's um, been really pleasing to see the, the way in which we've been able to work with Citizens Advice Bureau, for example, to join up our services to support our residents with a variety of different queries. Um, and we also highlight here some of the capital funding which has been invested um, throughout um, the, the year as well. In terms of um, supporting people at home and in their community, um, this section talks largely around the um, corporate response to coronavirus, where we've been supporting our colleagues in the health service around mass vaccination and testing, as well as um, alongside the chief executive and the leader, I continue to meet regularly with colleagues from across the public sector in order to coordinate and respond to um, what has obviously been a, a, a very challenging couple of years. And then finally, in terms of the um, fourth objective around respecting, enhancing and enjoying our environment, um, we talked earlier on today Day about Project Zero, so we're going to that again, but um, looking here at highlighting some of the work um, that we've done around decarbonising within schools and also some of the, the council's buildings itself. Highlighting the co uh, community asset transfer of the UNE War Memorial um, and also the support for agile working practices, um, which obviously has a contribution to um, decarbonisation as well. In terms of um, this slide, this shows you, um, members, a snapshot um, of the actions and measures specifically within the remit of your committee. Um, so, for example, there are 144 actions, 129 of which were completed within the year, um, 15 of them have slipped. There are hyperlinks in the presentation for you which take you to that exception report so you can drill into those 15 actions and the four measures. 
During the second year of the um, coronavirus pandemic, we were reporting against um, slippage for COVID reasons and non-COVID reasons. And we continue to do that, this in this presentation. I'm proposing that this is probably the last time that we do that. Um, we've very much seen the balance now shift from being predominantly coronavirus um, impact on actions and measures to actually it being um, non-COVID related measures in, in the majority of cases now. And I think it, it makes sense just to, to treat all slippage against our corporate um, objectives in, in the same way and, and just give you a link to the exceptions in one go. Building on um, Councillor Johnson's point earlier on when we were talking about presenting the information around Project Zero, this slide here shows some of the areas where we need to give some particular focus to and improvement now as we move into the 22-23 year. Um, so within Objective 1, there's work to do in terms of redeveloping the Council's website, as well as replacing some of the technology that's in use at um, Contact One Veil. Vale. Jeff earlier on this evening mentioned the participation duties under the Act, um, definitely a, a massive area of priority for us, and I'm, I'm meeting with the leader and cabinet member next week to discuss the new Participate programme. There's some information here as well around um, completion of, of the refurbishment project we talked about capital earlier on this evening, as well as flagging the sickness absence, which I know committee have, have seen recently as well. And I'll be bringing a report to Cabinet after the summer recess around the strategic workforce plan and the people strategy to, to take forward some of those issues. Within the second objective, um, we're going to be looking at um, a focus around the 16 to 24 year old agenda, looking at um, specifically around the use of, of apprenticeship opportunities within different council services. They can play a really important part of, of our succession planning arrangements um, as, and as, as well as that. Um, looking to work further with our schools who are doing some fantastic work around the decarbonisation agenda, but something that we can definitely do more of. Um, I mentioned the wellbeing strategy and the wellbeing champions. Again, that's um, work that will be tied up with the people strategy that we reported after the, rec the recess chair and gives us an opportunity to work collaboratively with public health colleagues. The Move More Eat Well plan is, is a plan to do exactly what it says on the tin. How do we um, assist people to, to take healthy exercise and to eat a good diet? And then finally, um, in terms of respecting, enhancing and enjoying our environment, we'll be looking to develop that strategy for sustainable drainage systems. The local flood risk management strategy has been delayed pending guidance from Welsh Government, so is an area to progress, as is then um, work on our biodiversity forward work programme. Um, and we've talked at length today about the need to focus on our um, carbon um, reduction. And the key plank of that will be the, the Council's carbon management management plan and corporate asset management strategy and um, colleagues um, are working with Matt and I to get those to cabinet in September as well chair. The final part of this presentation is um, just a bit of an update in terms of coronavirus. Um, this slide sets out um, the history of um, reflecting on the learning from the, the pandemic. Um, Council approved a restructure of the strategic leadership team, for example. I mentioned that we're looking now at how we use our corporate assets in terms of office accommodation going forward um, and supporting remote working as a new way of working for all council colleagues who can do so. Um, we are continuing to support arrangements in terms of um, mass immunisations. The Colcott Sports um, Centre testing site has, has now wound up um, as part of the UK government's reduction in, in testing capacity um, because of, of changes to, to the pandemic's nature. Um, and finally then, reflecting on all of this in terms of how we drive forward our transformation programme, importantly around how we use our assets, how we use our resources and how we continue to work with our communities. Thank you, Tom. Is that uh, that's the presentation? Wonderful. That's the presentation. Great, thank you. Do we have any questions, any queries on, on what we've just heard? Thank you, Councillor Johnson.
Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I don't want to um, keep us here, here too long, but I just want to um, sort of uh, pick Tom up on uh, some of the um, the exception report issues because, um, as I say, having been a member of this committee before, I'm aware that, that some of these have been, been hanging around, it feels, for, for a little bit of time. And whilst I, I appreciate the um, you know, originally, we we brought in the sort of the the COVID non COVID related um, you know, sort of issue just to sort of flag up whether it was something that was directly attributable to the pandemic or whether it was something that had happened regardless and, and you know under normal circumstances would be uh, would be resolved. Um, but there are a couple of issues um, that are, uh, are are there and, and you know sort of don't seem to be. Um, you know the sticky issues that don't seem to be moving. So I think you know a little bit of reassurance along the line about um, C1V um, and what's going on there because if something that's COVID related, it's, it's really it's been on on our list here for about two years, isn't it? Um, you know that we couldn't do things. Um, there's a, a an issue relating to children, and young people, and families, which I think is always. Uh, I think we, we queried last time as to you know what that was actually about and how it was being resolved and I think we were told that a new member of staff was in place but it seems to um, you know still be here you know has has that actually been resolved um, there's all sorts of issues ongoing outside of our control with with Wookiees the Welsh Community Care Information System I know that Audit Wales the Auditor General has, uh, has written about that again recently so I think understanding quite where that sits in terms of you know our responsibility and our ability to to work within that uh, and, and last but not least um so we've had a it's now more than i think more than two years since we announced as a, as a council that uh, we would be having a review of um building street names monuments etc et uh, i mean there was a hope that that would be completed by um by the time of the election um and and yet i don't think that that committee uh, has met since last September. Uh, I missed that meeting due to uh, due to being ill with COVID. And um, although we raised this, I think probably in what was February or March, um, nothing has really been uh, announced since. And obviously, we've had an awful lot of uh, work going on with the elections and with uh, with reconfiguring everything post election. But um, you know that was a commitment that was made that was made quite publicly by this council and has not been uh, acted upon yet. Um, I don't know if that that comes back to the early discussions we were having about democratic services being appropriately uh, resourced, etc., to do this work. But obviously, large, large numbers of the people who are on the committee at that point uh, will not be on the committee because they're no longer members of the council or on a cabinet position and therefore unable to to contribute. So that's uh, that's the range of things that sit in our exceptions um, that have have been there quite a while, I think. And you know, it would be good to see um, see see progress on this. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Johnson. Uh, Tom, can you comment? I, I can comment on, on some, but not all, if that's OK. <laughs> um, and for the ones that I can't, I will get an answer from somebody who can for Councillor Johnson. So in terms of the c one v refurbishment, um, project. Absolutely. I've, I've met with colleagues now in the last couple of weeks to to look at the scope of that and, and, and have asked that that goes to tender following the school um, asset renewal programme in the summer. Um, the reason for the, um, the delay is, is actually down now to a, a change in the scope of, of what we're looking to, to do there. Originally, Councillor Johnson, it was about um, maximising the number of people that we could get into that, that space and ensuring that it was adequately um, ventilated and the lighting and, and general kind of environment was, was good for a large number of people. Um, we've seen some changes in the working practices with the contact centre, also an increase in the number of colleagues that um, are co-located there from the health service in, as part of the Wellbeing Matters project. So, so actually the way that we're looking to use that space and is, is not now just about as many people as possible, but a bit more flexibility in the use of the space. So that's had a knock on in terms of the um, design scheme, in terms of what mechanical and electrical works are, are required. So, um, but that one is, is definitely on my, my agenda to move on with. Um, in terms of the um, wiki system, um, I, I took a report um, to Governance and Audit Committee earlier on this week. It remains one of the, the corporate risks. And what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll ask Mark if he can circulate an extract from the risk register as an update for elected members of, of this committee um, in terms of how we're, we're managing that, that risk. The articulation in the register does show the 
the um, kind of boundary, I guess, as, as you alluded to, Councillor Johnson, in terms of what's within our control and, and what isn't. Um, the street names and monuments um, review is, is something that is on my list to discuss with, with colleagues to, to look at um, reconvening that, that panel. And as you say, the membership will have obviously changed now subject to the, the election. So something for me to have a, a conversation with the cabinet member and, and to, to get working again. Um, in terms of the action around children and young people and, and families, that's something if, if you're comfortable, I'll take away and ask for some colleagues to, to give me that information from, um, from children's services. That's yeah. great. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, do we have any other questions for him on this? Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's, it's just a quick one, Tom, and it's in relation to the uh, dealing with corporate complaints. And I'm just wondering if there's any analysis being undertaken about sort of is that uh, around staff not feeling empowered to be able to make decisions, uh, even at a lower level, to get the complaints moving? Because I note that there's there seems to be some some information or, um, in terms of um, breaches of timelines and escalating it up to managers. And, and, and I was just wondering if if that's going to be looked at in terms of staff feel, having ownership of the complaint at a lower level and having the ability to make decisions and use their own judgment. And I was just wondering if any analysis had been done on that sort of um, empowerment to um, lower sort of grade staff to um, move the complaint process along. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, actually, to my knowledge, no, that kind of analysis hasn't been done. Um, the annual corporate um, complaints and compliments report is actually due to come to um, Governance and Audit Committee in September. We've moved it forward from the October um, meeting. And, and that's actually something that I can ask the operational manager to, to have a look at reflecting on. The report does set out um, a series of reasons for um, complaints themselves having been made, but I think it would be interesting and, and very useful for elected members to, to first track that through the process. So um, the comment is really timely. I can, can ask him to, to do some work on that ahead of that report, which will go to Governance and Audit Committee, and then it will also go on to, um, to Cabinet as well. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, that was something I also had to pick up on, and and I believe that if you've got you know sixty percent of your complaints only being you know within time slots that you've set for yourself, that's quite low, and uh, it is a little bit worrying because it is people's perception of us, isn't it? How we deal with our complaints. So, and I did wonder if there was any correlation with the because we've also got on our um, on our. Um, exception report, haven't we? Um, delays in looking at the customer relations operating model. I don't know if there could be any kind of if if that's something that's uh, just been put to one side for now. But um, but yeah, it is an important thing that I'd really like us to get a handle on whether we have a centralised complaint system so that there is that governance or some something. But um, something better okay. than sixty <laughs> percent. Absolutely, I can can definitely provide assurance that there's a um, from a non-social services complaints there is a centralised system and that's moving to the yeah. new technology platform that that we're introducing. And um, the the breaches or delays in um, res resolving those complaints then tend to sit within service areas. So there's there's definitely something for us to to unpick there to understand. Um, is that cultural or is that capacity? Is it a combination of, of things? So um, so I'll, I'll get some of that analysis um, explored a little bit more in that report. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, I think it was Councillor Goodjohn next. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just adding in on the point that you raised about uh, this is about people's perception of the council. Um, C1V is a very important part of how the council communicates with the public um, and the reputation of the council has not always been the best as it is with most councils across uh, Wales and the UK um, and that 
if we do not have proper communication with the public, especially as we know they have difficulty with contacting uh, some councillors uh, and have had bad experiences in the past that they will not trust the council in the future. So these are very, very important points uh, to be raised. Absolutely agree. However, I would also note that these are mostly the exception to the rule and in general the Council has been fantastic, as has been pointed out uh, in the report, with setting out most of its targets and most targets that have not been achieved. The majority of them uh, are being progress made, progress being made towards them. And I want to thank your uh, staff for that and uh, you yourself, Tom, for doing so much hard work. Um, but I would note that these exceptions are very important exceptions that um, whilst the council may not um, be so worried about its reputation sometimes because it's what really matters is delivering things on the ground. If people do not trust the council to uh, communicate properly with them, then that is when problems occur in the public. So just to raise that these are very important exceptions, but they are at the end of the day exceptions. And thank you. Oh, thank you for that, Councillor Goodjohn. And we have a hand from Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you, Jade. Very quickly, I just wanted to pick up on, on that point about um, uh, CUNV uh, wait times and things like that. I was just uh, trying to uh, scroll through and find the forward work programme. I think it's quite normal that we have um, Tony Curlis um, from, from you know, come to talk to us about issues relating to CUNV, the operational manager. Uh, I don't know quite where that is in our forward work. I don't know if anybody can help me with that. Um, and one of the issues, because we obviously, this is a, um, so I said this is a you know the C1V re re reform is is something that's been uh, you know sort of on the agenda for a while, which is why it's there as COVID related. But I mean, one of the interesting discussion points that we've had as a committee previously uh, is the the relevance of us setting targets for um, for example um, you know sort of uh, wait time uh, whilst phoning versus um, customer satisfaction. And I think one of the interesting points that's arisen in those discussions over the years has been that um, almost there's a, a post hoc response from the um, the public. People who have their complaints successfully resolved think that the, the, whatever the time that they have waited is generally worth it because they've got what they want out of it. Whereas people who feel that they haven't got the required support or answer from the service after waiting a long period of time, um, you know, give provide a more negative um, you know, viewpoint of it. So I, I think there's, um, you know, so there's sometimes there's a a question there about monitoring outputs versus monitoring outcomes. And um, I think it'd be good to have um, Tony in to provide us with an update on on how everything is going, um, particularly in light of you know sort of the um, the progress that Tom was discussing earlier, um, but also to to have a consideration of whether we are measuring you know, the right things um, you know when we when we're doing that as well. Um, and I think the customer satisfaction is the most important outcome. Um, these are the people that use our services, pay our council tax, and serve to get the service that they that they uh, that they want. Uh, from us. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. That's great. And um, I would also be very grateful if we could have um, a little presentation from, was it Tony Curlis who said Councillor Johnson? That's because right. for us, for us new members as well, it is something that, as we've all agreed, is really important. We want to make sure that um, we do what we can to improve performance with um, with everybody's experience of using contact one and it would be lovely to know exactly how we monitor the performance what the targets are so um i would welcome a presentation from him in the future for the next meeting or the next one when he can fit us in that would be great do we have any other questions or comments on what we've just seen no that's wonderful so um i think then that we're probably at a position where we can finish i think we can start to wrap this up can't we um so if we can move on what we've heard today and can i have a nomination for that <laughs> we can have a cough from <laughs> council lovelock edwards um and anybody else to um second that happy to second it chair that's wonderful Councillor Hanks. thank you Councillor Hanks. um so I think that's it then for tonight. Um, I'd like to thank everybody's contribution and for bearing with us in this heat. Um, we won't be meeting now until a scheduled meeting, which I think is the 14th of September at 6pm. 
So um, hopefully you will all have a lovely summer and um, we shall meet again. Thank you. Chair. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody.